for any developer to have is one um python is very ubiquitous now like it's, it's used in almost any field you go to nasa people are using it for wonderful things um, over there and uh, mostly for back end and when it comes to ai and machine learning there is no two ways about that you are definitely going to have to use python so um, knowing python is very key is very important and also knowing how to build back end because i know most of you follow um, eric's tutorials a lot and he is more into electronics but at the end of the day, everyone is talking of um, Internet of Things, Internet of Things, and people are demonizing it any way they want. But the truth is, it's going to be the future where we're going to have lots of machines talking together, lots of devices talking together. And um, as this future becomes a reality, more and more of our skills are going to be needed. So if you know how to build APIs, especially because um, when my machines are communicating they are not going to do all those front end your buttons and stuff like that it's going to be one machine passing information as binary or test to another device somewhere over the internet and so um, it, it becomes very important for you to know how to build back-end systems that um, helps different pieces of software components to talk together and in in, in the um, world of hardware your software will also be able to empower one hardware to talk to um, another hardware. So I'm very glad to have you here. Now, before we start, I would like to ask how many of you know Python? Like, um, you are okay with Python? Okay, I've seen one thumbs up from, um, I think that is Enoch. How about Asedu? Asedu, can you hear me? Okay, so Rhoda also says um, she knows Python. Now, for me, I have a bit of experience, but not that much. Okay. I use it, I use it during my internship. That's what okay. I'm not really against it. Okay. So, um, the, the good news about Flask is that it's just a library in Python. So, um, it's good you know a little bit of Python, but you don't need to be like top-notch Python programmer to, to understand how to use Flask. So, um, what I'm going to advise is, um, feel free to stop me anytime I am doing something you don't understand so that I can spend time to hone in my skill on it. Um, this is a five day event, so I'll have a lot of time. It's actually 10 hours, so I have a lot of time to explain things to you. The most important thing here is for you to understand what is taught instead of taking notes. So um, I, I don't expect you to be taking notes, but when I'm writing code, you should also try to replicate the code on your computer so that if you get an error you can ask me a question about why you have an error and then i can explain to you and i will also encourage you that after this session you need to try to replicate everything that i taught you off head that is how you can reinforce what you have learned in this session otherwise um, the, the, it's funny when you are learning programming you might feel okay i've learned i understand it but then when you actually begin to um, try to build something different, then you realize you didn't understand it properly. So it would be good that after the session, just be creative, come up with any silly idea you can think of and then try to replicate it with the knowledge you have gained from here. So um, one last thing before we actually start coding is, um, for you to be able to build backends, you need to be able to know how to talk to databases, you need to be able to um, know how to set JSON, you need to be able to know how to intercept HTTP requests and handle them. So those are going to be the focus areas of um, this course. And then on the last day, I will show you one very key trick that is um, being able to deploy your application on a server because of course, what's the use of a web application that is only sitting on your computer? So I'll teach you how to build and also deploy it um, in the cloud and make it accessible for everybody to um, be able to use it. And it is our hope that by the end of this whole webinar thing, by Friday, you guys can jump on the train and then begin to help to fight um, Corona with your new skills. Just think of any idea that you can build to help your community, to build Ghana, to help the world and um, make a name for yourself and humanity. Okay, so I'm going to start. Any question before I start? Yeah, um, I have a question. Okay. Um, why did you, why did you decide to, or why do you have to use Python to build a backend? 
why not um, no js or any other okay um, that, that's a very good question um the truth is when it comes to building software i in particular do not like to uh, indulge in technology wars like hey this language is better than this this language is better than this it's about using the tool that you know to build um, a solution out there so for me it doesn't matter i don't have um, one selling point as to why i would choose um, um, python over node.js except the fact that i have used python for long it is uh, ubiquitous it is it is versatile you can use it everywhere and it works very nicely the language is very elegant so when you write python i mean people who are not programmers will be able to make sense of your program because it looks so much like english as as opposed to um, what you will find in um, other languages but like i said i don't engage in language wars because uh, they said if the only tool you have is a hammer then any problem begin to look to you as a nail that is why it's also good to a lot of technologies yeah because um, many projects have failed because people um, spent a lot of time engaging in technology wars i have worked on projects where in like three months, they have not been able to decide on what technology to go with because people are doing, oh, and C is faster. You get that? Is the person asking a question? I don't think so. Okay. So, I mean, it, it, it is just about um, the niceness of the language and how matured it is. It has a lot, a lot of libraries that you can use to um, um, build anything that you want. And by the way, um, if if you go with Node.js, even for creating just the project, you know how many dependencies you are bringing into your project. That just a, I'm not. I understand. Yeah, I understand because I, rem I remember I um, I tried building um, a back end for um, should I say an IoT that I was trying to develop, and. I only use Node.js to see how easy it would be, and I realized that it was quite a task. So yeah, yeah. I mean, just for creating an empty project, you are bringing over hundreds of dependencies into your project. So yeah, yeah. plus um, JavaScript itself being single threaded. So if you have to um, do anything concurrently, then you have to do a lot of dirty tricks in there. So this is the kind of advantage. But I like Python because of the elegance. That how much here it is, the availability of libraries and the availability of software. Yeah. So Eric, I'm trying to share my screen, but I'm not able to. No. Eric. Why? Eric. Hello. Now we all try to uh, mute our uh, mic so that at least when the training is going on, we can all hear it. So only those who are ready to ask questions will turn them on. Hello, Python. Uh, Pi. Yeah. Uh, you can actually share the screen. No one is on it. You can actually share it. Yeah, but I'm not able to do that. Oh, really? Let me see. I don't know why. Yeah, try again and let me see. Yeah. Nope. I can I can do schedule back to meeting, but then um, join and share screen is not working for me. Anyway. Uh, who else? Apple, Apple, can you try yours to LSC? Because we've been. Okay, I'm trying. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Apple's. Apple, uh, that's yours, right? Or oh, Pi? Pi's. No, oh, that's not mine. I think it's okay. Someone. Yeah. It's someone. Someone. It's okay, let me let me share. I think now I can share. All right. Are you the one using Jupiter? Hi. No, no. I, I'm the one. I'm, I'm I'm taking it off now. All right. I'm just All trying right. it out. Okay. 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 So I think I should be able to share now. Okay. So. Um, uh, yeah. You guys can see my screen now, right? Mr. Patrick, I can still see your screen. No, not yet. It's still the Jupiter. It's still the Jupiter, yeah. Um, whoever is sharing the Jupiter, my screen will have to stop it. 
Iya. Oke, oke. Yeah, we got you. Yeah, we got you. Yeah, we got you. Okay, all right. So, um, I, I have prepared some simple notes on my iPad going to guide me through um, what I'm going to do. Like I said, the focus is to teach you how to build web applications and web apps. So, I want this to be very hands-on. So, we're going to start from the word go. And um, if you don't understand it, like I said, prompt me, feel free to stop me in the middle of whatever I'm doing and then um, let me be able to assist you. So, can, can I, you can all see... Um, okay, ask. Yeah, you mentioned teaching development of the back end using Python and then the deployment. When does the Flask come in? Okay, so Flask is basically a micro framework in Python. So, think of it as a library, okay? You, you, Python is a language you are using to build the web application, but Flask is a framework, and a framework is basically um, a piece of code that has already been written by people that provides you the skeleton that you need to add your own um, um, logic to, you understand? So think of it as, you know when people are building um, tall buildings, you know they have these things they call uh, who can help me here they use these frames like they, they have some frames that they use it helps them to climb up and then fix things uh, the scaffolds or something exactly the scaffolds yeah so um a library is like a scaffold it is not an application it helps you to build your own application do you get it now yes it makes sense now. okay all right cool so i'm going to start off by creating a project into which we want to store our source code. So um, let me see where I am. Is my, is my terminal legible enough? Is the font size big enough for you to see? I think it's quite size. Okay. Yeah. Is it bigger Okay. Is it bigger now? Yeah, it's okay. I think it's better now. Okay, all right, great. So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to create a folder let me go to my desktop and place the folder there so i'm going to create a folder um i'm going to call it flask webinar or something yeah so this you can do on any operating system i just use the term now you can right click and then do your, your whichever style you want now the first thing you need to keep in mind is whenever you are working with python never ever 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 create a project and install dependencies in your global python installation okay when i talk of global python installation that is the default python you have on your computer there is a solution called virtual environment that helps you to have isolated python instances for every project that you work on let me try to help you uh, make sense of it for for example think of yourself working on two different projects and uh, one project depends on let's say python's mysql library okay and another project also depends on mysql library but for some specific reasons project a depends on the library version 1.2 and project b depends on the library version 2.4 if you use your global Python installation, it becomes impossible for you to run both projects using the Python that you have installed on your computer. Because the moment you install 1.2, then 1.2 is what's available. When you upgrade it to 2.4, you overwrite what is in 1.2, and so project A will begin to fail, okay? So a virtual environment gives you an isolated Python instance. So feel free to always create virtual environment per project that you work on. And the way to create a virtual environment in Python um, with Python 3 is you say Python. I mean, you can always check which version of Python you have by saying which Python. And this, this is going to tell me where my Python is going to come from. I have I happen to have a, um, an Anaconda installed, which is also a Python installation. Don't, don't worry about that. As long as you have Python installed, you should be fine. Okay. So um, I'm going to say, and you can also do Python 3, since I am on um, a Mac computer. Let me quit this quickly. Why is this thing too? Okay, great. So you can do Python 3 minus M 
Okay, first thing, first thing that you need to do, check the folder in which you are. I created a folder called um, Flax Webinar. So I'm going to CD into Flax Webinar. Now, if I do PWD, I can see that I'm in the Flax Webinar folder. What I'm going to do now is I'll say Python 3 minus M V E N V. And then env let me explain this simple command so python 3 minus m whenever you use minus m on python it means you are invoking some module python 3 ships with the virtual environment module it's a module in python so if you say python 3 minus m v n v which is virtual environment you are invoking the python virtual environment to create a new instance of python for you and that instance i want to call it env the reason i'm calling it env it's not because if you choose any other name is wrong, but conventionally in the Python community, we tend to call it ENV to uh, mean environment, okay? So once I do this, you wait for a while. What, what is going to happen with this command is, it's going to make a copy of the Python you have on your computer, and it's going to make it available only in that folder. So now I'm going to open the folder and then you see what happened in there. So I'm going to open that folder. You see that I created a folder called Flask Webinar over here. And inside it now we have an ENV folder because I called my virtual environment ENV. When you go into ENV, you can see bin, include, lib. This is everything that the global Python installation on your computer has. It has been copied into the project. So now, how do we make use of our virtual environment? The way we make use of it is to source it so that now when you type Python, it is a virtual environment that is going to be active, not your global Python installation. Again, if you have any question, just feel free to um, ask me. So to source it, you say source- Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. So this, this is with Mac and then using it from the, the terminal. So if I'm using Anaconda on Windows, mm -hmm. how relevant is this to the Anaconda on Windows? Yeah, so um, Anaconda also solves what virtual environment does. You know you can create a new environment with Anaconda, right? And it's the, it's the same idea. They don't want you to have um, all your global, your dependencies installed in your global Python. So with Anaconda, you can do conda create and you give it a name and then you even specify the version of Python that you want to use. So Anaconda actually takes this, this process um, a step even further. So now I am using Python 3. I also have an Anaconda, by the way. I am using Python 3, so I can only create a virtual environment for Python 3. But with Anaconda, I can be in Python 2 and create a virtual environment for Python 3.7 because it is connected online and it will download everything and set it up for you. I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. Okay, great. So, to um, activate your virtual environment, you do source EMV and then you go into the bin and then activate. So, once you do this, why is this thing slow? I don't know what's happening. Yeah, so note, note how my terminal has changed. Initially, it was showing just base because um, it was a base Python installation on my computer that was active. But now you can see that it has ENV here, which means my virtual environment is active. How do I know that it's active? I can say which Python. What this means is that which Python will be invoked when I, I invoke the Python term, um, um, interpreter. You can see that it is invoking the Python in the Flask webinar folder, the new virtual environment that we created, okay? So now we have our virtual environment created and the focus of this video is to teach you how to build applications using Flask. And you know that Python on its own doesn't ship with Flask. So how do you get Flask on your computer so that you can start developing with it? It's as simple as saying pip3 install Flask. Pip is um, the dependency manager that ships with Python. It helps you to download dependencies off the internet. Like I said, when you are building any um, non-trivial application, you definitely will have to depend on third-party packages or libraries. So Pip 
ships with Python. Once you have Python installed on your computer, you have pip also installed. And pip allows you to download and install dependencies. So once I do pip3 install flask, it is going to go onto the internet, it's going to go to the Python's um, dependency repository, and it's going to fetch flask and it will bring it onto um, our virtual environment. So I'm going to hit enter. And at this point, you definitely need an um, internet connection. Okay, great. So it, it has finished installing um, flask. Then let's go ahead and then begin to write code in Flask. I'm going to open the folder once more. Whatever is keeping this thing slow is not funny. Yeah. So I have I have the folder Flask webinar open here. One more thing I'm going to do is to um, open it in Visual Studio Code so that we can begin to write our code in there. So, once Visual Studio Code shows up, let me know if um, the font is also too small for you. Um, excuse me. Yeah. Could you go back to how to activate the okay. um, virtual okay. environment once again? Okay. I'll definitely do that. So this is how I activated it. You say source and then the name of the virtual environment. We call it ENV. So source ENV slash pin slash activate. Sorry. You get it. Uh, uh, hello, Pi. Yeah. Can I uh, also write my code in any... Uh... Test editor. Test editor, yeah. Yeah, yeah, feel free. Any any test editor that supports UTF-8 or Unicode, you can you can write your Python code in there. Okay. I just happen to use um, Visual Studio Code because I don't like to use um, Python with IDs. It's okay. too simple a language to yeah, I have the, I have the Max, so I want to. Okay, yeah. I mean, you, then you are even low level. Yeah. So I'm going to create a file. I'm going to call it app.py. And so when I come to Visual Studio Code, I'm just typing something so that you, you tell me if the font is big enough. Can you see it or I need to increase font size? You can see, right? Yes, it's okay, but uh, if you can increase it just a bit. Okay, one more. Yeah, okay. Okay, great. So, how do we start building um, applications with Flask? Now we have Flask installed, so we need to import Flask. So we say import, you can say um, from Flask import. Flask. From Flask means we are importing the Flask dependency that we installed. Okay. And this Flask with a capital F is the class that we are interested in for, for um, those of you who already are familiar with Python. We are importing the Flask class from the Flask library. Okay. Now, conventionally, you start off by saying app is equal to Flask. And then you put in underscore underscore name. Now, what 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 happens here? Let me let me try to um, help you understand how Flask is working with a web server. So when you finish building your application, you are going to deploy it onto a web server. Even before you finish building it and deploying it, Flask comes with um, a development web server, which we will start very soon to be able to try our application in the browser and see how things work. And um, the default development server that comes with Flask is called Vexoege. So Vexoege is um, a German word that is um, that means work tools. I happen to be in Germany now, so I can speak some small German. So this is Vexoege. Yeah. So this is um, a German word that means work tools. So it's the name of the server that ships with Flask as well. Now, when you create this Flask object, 
it is what the flags um, your web server is going to use to pass the request into your application so your web server is a computer sitting somewhere on the, on the internet or even during development your own machine now when someone goes to your browser and types in the url of the web application you are building it first of all hits the server and then the server is going to capture all the relevant information about the request and then it will make it available to you through this application instance that we have created okay now in um, web development what happens is unlike desktop applications where it is more event driven like you place a button and then you register uh, an on-click listener so that when they click something happens in web development the way things work is you match requests to urls so for example if you want to go to facebook right now you go to www.facebook.com okay once it goes there in facebook source code there is a function that handles that request if you go to your profile page there is another function in your source code that handles fetching everything related to your, your profile and showing it on the page so for you to do a similar thing you use the app to register what is known as a route so a route is just a mapping between a function and a URL this thing this whole thing is going to make sense to you in five minutes so bear with me now I come here and then I say at app dot route then I'll say def index then I'll say return this is my site okay now once we have this code what is happening is we are telling the flask um, web server that whenever a request comes to the root of our website let this function be called the function we i call it index because usually the root of every website is known as the index of the website the, the index page the home page that you hate okay so on our home page we just want to show this is my site basically that is that is all we want to do then when you finish what you want to do now to be able to run this application there are two approaches so i'm going to show you um, all the two approaches and then um, you decide which one works best for you so with this code written, I'm going to go back to the terminal. And I will, first of all, you have to tell um, Flask which file it should run, okay? So to do that, you say you need to export Flask app. It's equal to app.py. So what I'm telling Flask is that whenever I call Flask to run, I want it to run the, the application in app.py. If you're on Windows, you will not do a spot. Instead, you do set. Thanks to Bill Gates and his children, they always want to be radicals. So everybody says a spot, they say set. Okay. So because I am on a Macintosh, and anybody who is on a Unix system, just do a spot. So you say a spot plus app is equal to app.py. The app.py, don't forget, is the name of the file that we we have written our code in. Okay. So once you export this environment variable now you can say flask run let's see what happens so flask has started a web server so you can see that he's saying seven flask app app.py how did he know that it is seven app.py because you exported this environment variable flask app and you gave it app.py and he says environment production warning this is a development server do not use it in a production deployment the reason why they give you this warning is not because your code is wrong but like i told you the server that comes with flask by default is just um a test server it's for development only so it is not safe it is not secure if you use this to run your application in production hackers can hack your application as time goes on i'll show you whenever your application throws an error this server will actually give a python interface in your in the web browser so imagine I come to your website and there's a mistake in your source code and instead of just telling me, oh, there is a mistake, your browser actually renders a terminal within which I can type Python. Your life is finished. Because like I have full control over your server and I can do whatever I want to do. That is why they warn you. So for development purposes, it is okay to use Vexorget. But for deployment, you definitely have to go with G Unicorn. And when the time comes, I'll show you how to deploy with G Unicorn. So, so it is telling you running on HTTP 127.0.0. So it is telling you how you can access your application. So 
I'm going to open um, a browser now, and then I hope my browser is also big enough. And I'm going to go to http colon slash slash um, localhost because localhost is the same as one two seven zero dot one. Can you see the browser now? Okay. Can, can you all see um, the, the site running in the browser? We can. Okay, great. So, yeah. so any questions up to up to this point? Because we we start getting deeper and deeper. So, I I want to make sure you understand everything that's going on here. Sorry, I'm a bit lost uh, from the environment to the Visual Studio, then back to the API. I don't want to drag you, so I'll take my time and then follow us. Maybe later I'll be sending emails for or comments so that I will, I will drag the class. Okay, but um, at least the code here you should understand, even if you don't yes. uh, understand how you created the, how we created the environment, how we activated it, at least the code you should understand. So do you have any? Yes, I do that. Yeah. Rhoda, do you have any issue with the code? Is Rhoda there or she's gone? And also after after we do the Flask run, mm -hmm. I think I'm getting, this is a development server. Do, do not use it in the production. After that step, what else do we do? Yeah, so um, you can see that it is telling you running on HTTP colon slash slash one two seven zero zero dot one. So it is telling you what you need to put in your browser to be able to see your application. Okay. So you can just copy that HTTP colon slash slash one two seven zero 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 dot one port five thousand. So by default, Flask runs on port five thousand. Like when you go to Facebook, for instance, you just type facebook.com because Facebook is running on port eighty, and okay. port eighty you don't need to specify it in the browser. But for any other port, you need to specify. So it is running in port. Uh, it's running on port five thousand. That is why in my browser I typed localhost column five thousand, and I said localhost is the same as one two seven dot zero dot zero dot one. Okay. Right. Yo, Python. Uh, five. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the 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 one who has the issue with the, I think the one who spoke before Apple. I think address it so so that it doesn't become a loophole in his background. Else, following okay. up to is going to be a problem. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. So I'm going to I'm going to explain everything again. So I started off by saying um, it is not good for you to install dependencies into your global Python installation. And by the way, Rhoda, I'm not hearing from you. I hope you are you are still listening and following. So. Uh, um, it is not good for you to install dependencies into your global Python installation. And I gave the reason why. I set an example that let's say you have two projects, project A and project B. They both depend on, let's say, the MySQL Python library, okay? But project A, for some reason, requires version 1.2. Project B, for some reason, requires version 2.4. Now, if you just went ahead and you installed 1.2 in your global Python installation, what will happen is that project B will not run because it requires 2.4. In a similar vein, if because you want to run project B, you just go ahead and install version 2.4, project A will not run because it specifically demands that you have 1.2 installed. So the way Python solves this issue is through something called a virtual environment. And the way to create a virtual environment is to, so I'm going to stop the server. By the way, if you want to stop the server, just press Control C in your terminal. So the way to create um, a virtual environment is to say Python minus M V N V. So the Python minus M V N V is what will invoke the virtual environment module in Python. So what I need you to understand is every Python installation from, I think, 3.0 coming by default ships with the virtual environment module. So once you say Python 3 minus M, V, E, N, V, you are invoking the virtual environment module and you want it to create a new Python setup for you. You give it any name and we gave it a name, E, N, V. So what happens is once I press enter, which I'm not going to do because I already have um, a virtual environment created. What happens is 
In the project folder, you will see that there is another folder named env, and inside it is everything that makes Python Python. Okay. Then, for you to be able to use that, you need to activate it. Now, look at my terminal. It is showing env because I have activated it. I'm going to deactivate, and I will activate it again. To deactivate, you just say deactivate. Now, look at something. I have deactivated it. Then I'll say which Python. Which is a command, is a Unix command. I'm sorry, I don't know um, the version on Windows. Which Python, and look at what it's telling me. Without my virtual environment, if I invoke Python right now, it is going to invoke my global Python installation that comes from Anaconda 3. So you can see the path. It is telling you where it is going to get its Python interpreter from. But let me activate it and then you see. So I'll say source env bin activate. Now see that my terminal has changed and it's showing env. I'm going to execute the which Python command again. And then see that now the Python is going to be invoked from Flask Webinar, the folder in which we are doing this uh, webinar project. And it's going to use the virtual environment that sits in there. So it's basically, you are creating a new Python setup specifically for the project you are working on. Is it clear now? Um, hello? Yeah. Um, actually, the way you, you, you activated the virtual environment, I think it's for Mac OS. For Windows, it doesn't work. It's actually shows an error that source is not an internal yeah. command and all that. Let me, let me chip in. On Windows, you do uh, slash env slash scripts. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. and you don't do source, you don't do source. So there is a, a script in the Windows file, I think it's called Activate. Activate, check yeah. It. yeah, check okay, it. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm very yeah. sorry. I, mean, I haven't used Windows for like 10 years, and so I, I, don't, I don't even think about it. It's you guys who are reminding me that it exists. Yeah, you actually suffering with Windows here. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. What prop said is working, it works that way. Okay, so Eric, maybe you can share the command in there. Yeah, actually, uh, so you provide that and it's working as well. Nice, nice. So Eric, just share the command with them. Okay, okay. And um, a simple piece of advice, if you were a developer, try and move away from Windows, unless you are, you, you definitely have to do some Windows development. I mean, are you not tired of pointing and clicking and clicking and clicking and clicking? <laughs> yeah. You should be guys. You should begin to be guys. You should love the black screen. That's where the magic is. It's because you people use Windows. That's why Corona is the skill of the so <laughs> Move to the terminal and let's go through it. Okay, so I hope now everything makes sense. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the source code and I'll explain it once more. So I said. You start off by importing Flask for Flask. Um, Eric. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, you are disturbing us. It's not me anyway. So you you import Flask from Flask and then you create um, an instance of Flask. The reason why you pass this underscore underscore name underscore underscore. This underscore underscore name underscore underscore is actually a Python built-in variable that refers to the file in which the code is running. In order not to confuse you, let me let me do this example for you. So I'm going to create a Python file called test.py. Okay. Then inside test.py, I'm just going to print underscore underscore name underscore underscore. It's not magic, it's, it's, it's something in Python. So the underscore underscore name underscore underscore variable refers to the name of the Python file you are running. So let's go ahead and execute this code and you see what it will print. So I'll say python test.py. You see, it is, it is um, giving me underscore underscore main underscore underscore because I executed it from the, the um, terminal. Whenever you do Python, it treats it as a main function. So over here, what, what is happening is, inside this code, what is happening is, you are creating a Flask application instance, and you are telling it the root of your project. And because this underscore underscore name underscore underscore is going to resolve to app.py, 
it comes in handy when you begin to add images and trying to assess CSS and JavaScript in your project. The Flux web server needs to know how to traverse your path where the CSS file is. For now, um, it might sound like magic, but when we start adding Installing and stuff, which you understand. So take it at, as it is for now, and then if you have any question about it, keep it. Once we begin to talk about um, styling and JavaScript and all that, you can ask me, and then I will clarify why it is important. But what I need you to understand is particularly how to define uh, a view function and assign it to a route. Okay. So once you create the app instance, you use this decorator. Whenever you see anything that starts with apps in Python, it's called a decorator. So we are decorating this index function. Apart from this decorator, if I remove this code, this is a complete Python function. It's a very simple Python function that is returning this is my site, okay? But for you to use it as a route handler, and a route handler is a function that executes in response to some URL, you just add the route decorator to it. Let's do one more so that you understand. So let's say I'm going to, I want a profile page. What I'm going to do is I'll say app.route slash profile. Then I'll say def show profile. And by the way, the function name, you can choose any function name that you want. So over here, I'll say return your suite profile. Okay, now I'm going to run the Flask application once more by saying Flask run. And then I'll go to the server. So this is hitting the index, but look at the URL we used for the profile. We said slash profile. So if I come here, I'm going to do slash profile in the browser and see that it changes to show your sweet profile. Do you understand it now? If you don't talk, I'll take the silence to mean a yes. <laughs> yes, we understand. Great, that makes me happy. So there is this guy in his room with a fan and then he's um, behind his curtains. Can, do you understand me? The way, the way the fan is blowing you, do you understand me? Yeah, I understand. <laughs> but you can't be wasting electricity and say you don't understand. Otherwise, oh, I, I understand. <laughs> yeah, that somebody is wasting electricity this evening. Great. Okay. So, up to this point, we know how to define our route and then we know how to start the Flask web server. There's one more thing we can do. To, flag, um, to start the web server without necessarily having to do... So I'm going to quit the server. You remember we had to do um, export Flask app is equal to app.py, okay? If you don't like to run your application this way, if you think this is cumbersome, one more thing you can do or one more approach you can take is to define a main function in your code. So you say if underscore underscore name is equal to underscore underscore main underscore underscore then you say app dot run if you do this you don't need to do the export flask underscore app is equal to app dot py you don't need to do that once you place this function here python will know that okay you want to run your your flask application because of course you said if the name is equal to main this this code here means if you run the script by saying python app.py then it should call app.run so app.run will take care of starting the server and then serving your web application so let's try it so i come in here and um i say python so i'm using python 3 so i'll say python 3 app.py you can see that I didn't say flask run, I said python app.py and it has also successfully started the web server and um, blah blah blah. So you can see that the message I'm getting is similar to what I got when I used flask run. So you decide which one you like. This one, the flask run helps you to start your application on uh, the terminal and the uh, app.run helps you to start your application programmatically. 
I always want to go with this programmatic one because it gives you certain control. Like you can control certain things, and I'm going to explain that um, as time goes on. So, any question? Okay. So I'll take that as a no question, and uh, we're going to continue. So you can see that so far our our route handlers have been uh, just strings. And you, you might be wondering, okay, so what if I want to serve a full web page? Will I send the whole web page as a as, um, string? No, definitely not. We will get there probably tomorrow. I'll show you how to use a um, template. It's called template. So a template will help you to define your HTML file somewhere. And then you tell the server to serve that HTML. But even before we do that, you are free to add any HTML you want in here. So see, in case I want to bold in the this, okay? I can just add any HTML at all. And once I save it, I'm going to show you one thing more. So I'm going to go to the home folder. You see that the this over here, I don't know if um, it has been it has been bolded or not. But one thing you need to note about running your web server is um, reloading. Reloading happens whenever you change your source code and then you save it. If you enable reloading, Python will automatically restart the server. Okay? If you enable hot reloading, it will automatically restart the server whenever you make changes in your, in your source code and you save. I'm quitting it and then I'm going to use Flask Run to run it. I'll show you how to enable um, hot reloading without Flask Run as well. So now I'm saying Flask Run and it's running my application. When I come to the root, you see that now that the, the disk is bolding. I want to come here and then I'll change work. Um, this is my um, home something or home page. And then I will save. When I save, I want you to take note. Look at the, 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 the server logs. It is showing the old instance that I ran. But I'll come in here. I'll save this file. And then when you come back, you will see that it has reloaded because like you've enabled hot reloading. What hot reloading does is the moment you change anything in your code, it has to reload it for you. So if I go back, okay. So I think hot reloading is not enabled because I am doing um, the app.run here. Let me comment this guy out. And then for now, I have to kill and restart it. So mind you, if if you do Flask run, you don't necessarily need to have this um, app.run in here because it overrides what uh, Flask run does. So I'm going to say, I save this. Welcome to my home page. And I'll say, I'll say home site. So this is, if you are running it using Flask Run, you are free to not add this um, if underscore underscore name is equal to underscore underscore main. And you can also comment this guy out. And if you want to do that, I can quit. And then you just do Python 3 app.py. In this instance of the web server, you cannot access it over the network. What I mean is, right now your web server is running on localhost colon 5000. If you have two computers on your network right now, and you know the IP address of the one running your web server, you can't enter it into a browser on the other computer and access it. The reason is because you are running the application and you have not told it to make it available outside the local host. I don't know how many of you have uh, multiple computers with you right now, or if if your, your PC and your phone are connected to the same network, try and get the IP address of your PC, okay? And then and enter the IP address of your PC into your phone's browser and see if you can see the web page. I'm giving you five minutes to try it. By the way, you can just show by hand. If 
your phone and your computer are connected to the same internet if if you have that let, let us know so that we will let you do this um, experiment okay so um you have it so check your ip address check the ip address of your computer and tell us I hope the rest of you are following. I just joined, so I'm a little lost. But I, I think I'll catch up. Yeah. Hey, as for lost, there yeah, you'll be lost too. Because you joined um, 54 minutes after. Um, just make sure some lion doesn't eat you in the forest because you are very lost. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Saidu Mohammed is supposed to tell us um, his IP address and now his video is gone off. Who else has um, his or her laptop and phone connected to the same network? So maybe you have some MiFi in your room and then you've connected your, your, your PC and your phone to the same network. Okay, so um, in order not to waste more time on that, what I'm going to do is you, you can say host. So over here, you can say, what is this? Over here, you can say host is equal to 0.0.0.0. .0. Now, once you specify 0, .0, 0.0.0.0 as the host, what you are telling the, the um, Flask web server is that it should make the application available even outside your computer. So if you run it in this mode, what will happen is anyone who has your IP address can enter your IP address into the browser, colon 5000, and see your web app. So right now, if you, you, you have your phone and your PC connected to the same internet connection or network in your room, get your PC's IP address, enter it into your phone's browser. You can open Chrome on your browser, enter your IP address, colon 5000, and you should see the web application over there. Any questions so far? A uh, question. Yeah. Uh, should the two devices be on the same network? Yeah, they have to be on the same network. So one cannot be connected to MTN and the other connected to Vodafone. And if they are both connected, MTN, like the global MTN, it won't work. It should be a network in your room. So maybe you have a Wi-Fi, you have a router. The, the, the phone and the desktop are connected to that same router. That is when this setting is going to work. But of course, if you finish and you deploy the application into um, the cloud, you need to add host is equal to 0, .0, .0, .0, .0 before it will be available to the whole world. Otherwise, nobody can be able to see application. Maybe, maybe I can try. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, maybe I, I can try. So my phone, my phone and my um, computer are connected to the same network. So I'm going to restart the server. And then I'll check, I should have checked my IP address first. So let me kill the server and check my IP address. So IF config. On Windows, I think you do IP config. IF config and then I'll Grab 192.168. Okay, so my IP address is 192.168. So I'm going to go to http colon slash slash 192.168.178.255 colon 5000. So I don't know if you can see on my on my phone, but I am not able to access my web application because I have not run the server yet. And then I'll run the server now. I don't know what's making my terminal too slow. Hello, hello, Paz. Yeah. Can you show the screen again? Can you show your phone screen again? I want to capture it. Yeah, can, can you see? Uh, yeah. It's buffering. Okay. It's closer, a bit closer to the camera. Yeah, to the camera. Yeah. 
Can you see it now? Uh, yeah, reflections, but it's okay. It's uh, okay. It, it went up, right? No, reflections, but it's okay. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to run the server. Mohammed, have you been able to try this now? Yeah. Yeah, I'm now starting my server. Okay, started. I, I want one of you students to succeed at making this. Can you repeat the process again, please? So just check the IP address of your um, computer. Okay. Get your IP address and enter it into the browser on your phone. Make sure they are connected to the same internet. Okay. And then the port should be um, port 5000. Maybe on my iPad it will even open much better. Once we do this, uh, Eric, can you please uh, go back on the, the Windows configuring of the server? I, I, I've actually tried the... Oh, okay. The Windows. Is it the starting up of the virtual... My network, I, I lost connection when you were, you were giving the Windows guideline. I actually yeah, yeah, yeah. In the check the Windows message. Version. Check the message. I typed it there. I typed the command there. I check the messages. I it's check. a message, eh? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this one. Uh, one six eight dot one seven eight dot one zero nine one five five. I'm going to zoom in on my phone because it's showing very tiny on my phone. Okay, I think I have mine working on my phone. Okay, so I'm going to show. I don't know if you can see, but you can see the, the web page on my iPad, right? Yes, I can yes. see. Yeah. yeah, so what, what, what happens is if, if you run the app and you specify the host to be 0 .0 .0 .0, 0.0.0.0, then you are telling the web server that you want people to be able to access the web application outside your computer. So when when this thing will be useful is let's say you are building a voting um, software which I know a lot of Kenyan university people yeah. like to use for their Panaya project. So in case you are building a voting software and it, they are using it for um, the, uh, departmental voting, <laughs> you don't need to host it in the cloud. The reason is once you host it in the cloud, you give people an opportunity to try to hack it and then change figures in your database and all that. So for that purpose, you just go to that department, you run your server on host 0 .0 .0 .0. Oh, The 0 .0 0.0.0.0 in networking simply means make it available publicly, okay? So once you, you run it in that mode, then you find mm -hmm. your IP address and then you enter yeah. it on another computer's browser, colon 5000, mm -hmm. which is where you are running your application. And that should be able to uh, let, let people access it on their computer. So now, you can be in your room. Maybe you are building some Arduino project and then um, you have used Flash for the back end. You want to demonstrate it on your phone. Easy peasy. You run it on 0, .0, .0, 0 You open the um, page on your browser in, on your phone and you, you can showcase it. Okay? Should we take some five minutes break so that those of you who have not been able to get things running can try to get it run and then 
um, after five minutes, we come back to continue. So within this five minutes, prepare your questions. If you have any challenges, no. if you want to try what we've tried so far, try it, prepare your questions. And then it is nine, um, it is nine three at my end. Sure, good. So in five minutes time, I'll, I'll be back. Okay, thank you. So don't leave, you just, just, you can turn off your camera if you want to, turn off your microphone and then in five minutes time, we'll all be back here. Great. It's seven, right here. Okay. Uh, Eric, please, I haven't seen the message you're referring to. Hello, Mr. Atta. Hello, Atta. Okay, Asa, um, if you can hear me, if you can hear me, um, how to set it up on on the Windows? Um, have you have you ever have you created the special environment already? If not, I would I would type the command at the for the chats. Just a moment. Hello, Prof. Robin. Robin. Prof. Hello, Robin. Yeah, Afro. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Can you can you uh, give me the steps to check the stuff on my phone as he was explaining? I think okay. I really. Uh, do you have Do you have your Do you uh, have you configured the server to run on zero zero zero? The what the course that we just did. Yes. Uh, where have you got into? Is your server up and running at zero point zero point zero point zero? Yes. Let me let me show you my screen. If it's necessary. Can you see this? What I have? Uh, I your screen is not shared. Pi is still on it, so you can share. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So, um, so I go to the point where uh -huh. after I got the server, the one that you said we should uh, after I run the flask. Yeah. You know, I get the message that. Uh, this is a development uh -huh. server. Yeah. You see, we have debug mode off. Okay. Then beneath debug mode off, we have running on HTTP. Yes. What do you have there? Yeah. Yeah. HTTP 127.0.0.1. So you, you are still working on the. Colon 5. You are still working on a local host. So you can't access okay. it on your phone. Okay, so maybe pause, okay. on, pause on that particular one. When I upload the video tomorrow, then quickly go over and see how he did it. You get it? So that you don't end up confusing yourself with everything. You get it? Okay. Uh -huh. Before okay. you can, okay. you can okay. access on your phone, you have to be on the port 0 .0 .0, then you use your IP address to access it. But you haven't configured it yet, so you can't do that. Okay. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, okay. So you upload the videos later, right? Yeah, yeah, I upload it. I'll work on it tonight. Eric, please, I still haven't seen the message. Uh, I just so I by now. Okay, let me let me uh, message you directly. I'm going to message you that. You are at uh, you are at where? 
Is it on the WhatsApp page? No, 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 no. There is a chat associated with you. Uh, yeah. Look Where down the I'm asking. Chat. The Zoom, the app we are using, the Zoom. There is a chat session. Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. there is a chat. All right. Yes, I've sent, I've That's sent the code. Right. So just make sure you okay. have main folder containing the dot en, the containing the env folder. Then you enter. All right. The I just saw a message. I, I just saw a message. Actually, there wasn't any. There, there wasn't. At first, I checked and there wasn't any message there, so it just came. Oh, okay. Yeah. Please, anyone who needs help with anything. Hello, Rhoda. Are you the, the charity? Yeah, uh, I'm, so, I'm so struggling with that. I'm so struggling with creating the. Creating. Uh, okay. Um, creating a virtual. Uh, Virtual environment okay. in Jupiter. So this is what I'm. No, 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 no. You, you, you don't create virtual mm -hmm. environment. <laughs> you don't create virtual environment in Jupiter. But um, you maybe don't worry. Um, in this next section, I will finish that this section earlier so that I can do a recap of the top stories to to help those who didn't join earlier. Yeah. Then uh, Pi. Uh, okay. All right. Hello, Pi. Yeah. So maybe if you do something yeah. that is Mac specific, I can replicate it in Windows for those who are using Windows. Okay. Yeah, yeah, great. And maybe before you upload your version of the video, you can um, interleave it with a Windows specific way of doing things so yeah. that those yeah. who are using Windows uh, will do that. Right? Okay, cool. I hope that the Spirit of the Lord will touch most of you to leave Windows as early as possible. <laughs> I think it's about the money we have. See, most of us we are not that rich. So. As, as long as we have a laptop, it's just about decide. <laughs> Even Windows is expensive. <laughs> you don't need to be rich to get transition. Money. Transition is, is is very is very tiring. No, oh, I mean when you install Ubuntu, it takes like thirty minutes for you to finish, and uh, maybe three days to get all the drivers. No, but the, the the thing is, using Ubuntu itself um is is <laughs> it's just it, it's juicy. It's juicy. <laughs> So, it's, uh, it's just it's just uh, it's just, uh, it's just uh, laziness it's just take, laziness take, take it serious because like um if if you move outside ghana you won't do a lot with windows that's right. even in ghana uh, right. most companies do a lot yeah of but windows. maybe one thing that you can also do is one thing you can also do is as from for, for me i'm not i'm even using the ubuntu app okay so if you think Installing the whole Ubuntu is another problem. Just activate the Windows sub system for Linux and install the Ubuntu app. Then you can start gradually. Okay, that's what I am using at the moment. So, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah, but okay. Be careful if, if you are doing that. Otherwise, you might end up wiping your Windows and you cry. So maybe Eric, you you want to do a tutorial on that? For, on that. For the yeah, I will do a very sharp one, quick one. What somebody wipes it um, and tell you. <laughs> Which is definitely possible. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, but that's the best way to learn. Like, you wipe your, your computer, you don't have any new Do you remember I wiped your hard drive? I know, what have you done? Yeah, so. <laughs> um, we are going to continue. Did, did any of you write any questions that you want us to address before moving on? Okay, so um, I'll take your silence as a yes, and then we can continue. So we have so far seen um, how to bootstrap a virtual environment, how to activate it, how to install Flask, how to um, import Flask, and how to create a simple Flask application up to this point. Now, I used um, debug equals true, and I didn't explain why. and um, I intentionally did that. I was expecting that some, one of you will ask that, why have you put the bag there and not said anything about it? So it means you people are not observing 
a lot of things. So I want you to be observant. Next time when I do something without explaining, I want you to um, tell me. Okay. okay. Um, the thing is, some of us know the reason why I put it there. Okay. Yeah. So I, the, you are setting the bad mood to be true so that you can, in case of any errors, you notice. Exactly. So if, if there is any error, it will throw the error in the browser. And yeah. apart from that, enabling the bug equals true also enables hot reloading. And hot reloading is what will make it possible for you to just press, you save your file and you don't need to restart the server. Okay. So, um, for example, now it is running and you see that it's saying detected change in um, app.py reloading. It only became possible because I said the bug is equal to true. And once you set the bug is equal to true, it enables the debug mode, like you rightfully said. And what that one does is if there is any error in your application, it's going to throw an error in the browser. But never, ever, 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 ever use your web server in production with debug mode enabled. Because like I told you, it is going to throw the error in the browser and give you access to a terminal, a complete Python terminal that targets your server. So if you mistakenly enable the bug mode on your production server and something crashes, anybody visiting your site owns your site from that time on. So you don't want to do that. For development purposes, it makes sense because nobody wants to write code, save, go and restart server and come back to try. So when you are developing, definitely, definitely leave the bug mode on. I think um, in tomorrow's session, I'll, I'll show you um, an automated way of switching between the bug mode and um, production mode without having to um, deal with all these things. But one thing that um, debug does for you is to help you to turn on the debugger and also to enable hot reloading. So hot reloading basically lets you just save your file and then the server reloads on its own. That, that's, that's basically what happens. Okay, so one more thing. I am sure you've all noted that by default, um, Python is, or Flask is running our application on port 5000. If you want to change the ports on which your application runs, it's also very easy. So when you call app.run, you can also pass port. I think because of my font size, my code is getting out of focus. So I'm going to remove this and I'll drop it onto the next line. I'll say host is equal to 0 .0 0.0.0.0. And I will say debug is equal to true. And I will say port. So port, and then you specify a number. So if I want to run this um, on 2020, which happens to be a not so good year, at least for the first three months, you are free to change it. So once you do this and um, you you restart, for this, for, for this to take effect, if you change the port number, that one you have to manually, um, I think, restart the server, I guess. Yes, so you can see that now it is running on port 2020 instead of port 5000. So by default, Flask is going to choose port 5000. But when you finish and you are putting your application on in the wild, in the in the cloud, you don't want to, um, you, I mean, it's a choice. You don't want to put it on a, 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 a non-popular port number. And uh, the default port for most web servers is port 80. So you are free to put it on port 80. That one, um, nobody has to specify a port number. But the point when specifying port numbers become important is when you are running multiple web servers on the same computer, then you want to run one server on one port and another on another port. So feel free to choose um, um, any web, serv um, web server port of, of your choosing. Of course, there are some guidelines. So read about the HTTP protocol and know which numbers are reserved because something like 80, 80, 80, and um, some other port numbers are reserved for protocols such as Telnet and stuff like that. So you want to choose a port number that is freely avail uh, available on your server as well. And it's also um, a good choice. But So I'm going to go back to 5000. And of course, if you want to use 5000, there's no need for you to set it, but just for demonstration purposes. So, And if you change the port number, you will definitely have to restart the server because um, something has changed, something important about the server itself. So now I change it to 5000 and you can see that we have um, port 5000 over here. Okay, so up until this point, you can see, okay, we, 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 we found ways of registering routes 
and uh, we are returning our response as strengths. These are all baby stuff, but understanding these are very important so that we can move on to more interesting things. I'm going to show you how to perform a redirect, okay? So let's say um, you, you want to create a page just to redirect to another page. Who can tell me why it might even be necessary for you to do that? Why, why would you want to create a page? Let's say, um, let's say Sayyidu Muhammad, you've got a domain called sayyidumuhammad.com and then you create, you create a website and all it does is to redirect to another page. What scenarios comes into mind? Like, what do you think will warrant you making that choice? One of them, can I proceed? Yeah, yeah. Okay. One of them is when you are using authentication in your application. Okay. Possibly after registering, you might have to redirect the user to the main page or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that is, that is very valid. So, especially if you are using OAuth or you are doing um, social logins like signing with Facebook, signing with Google, signing with this. What happens is when you click sign in, you have to redirect them to Google servers or Google to authenticate them and bring you back a token that you can and use. So that is a very good uh, use case for it. Another use case is maybe you had an older domain, okay, and you've bought a newer one, but people are used to the older domain. People know the older domain and you maybe you are rebranding your company. So your old company was called uh, minimumaminaya.com and now you think um, you want to modernize it by saying mnn.com. So what happens is you just buy the mnn.com domain, you write your code to it to uh, minimumaminaya.com so that people will come to mnm.com but they will still access minimumaminaya.com. Or if you like, you move your new site to mnm.com and you redirect minimumaminaya.com to mnm.com. So like, so let's let's do some fake Google web page. So I'll say app and if you're a scammer amongst us don't use this to scam people don't go and create a page direct direct to mtn momo website and then mimic certain things and take people's numbers okay so i'm going to say um fake google and what is going to happen in here is i want to say go to google and like I told you, the function name, feel free to name it any way that makes sense for your application. What happens here is you do redirect and then you put the site that you want to redirect to. So I'll, Google is of course on uh, HTTPS, right? So I'll say um, google.com. Okay, so when you save it, just make sure that your code has reloaded and then the route is fake Google. So let's go to the browser and I'll do slash fake Google and let's see what happens. So, um, uh -huh. so this is a very good error that we have found. So this is what happens if your application throws an error. You can see that it is telling you type error. The view function did not um, return a valid response. The function either ended. Um, your your pictures are covering what I see in there, but return none or without any return statement. Who can tell me what is going on here? This is how I teach, and thankfully this is Python, so I like to make mistakes and then you guys can figure it out. So who can tell me what you think is wrong here? I guess this is the question of what you think. What? I remember you just said. I remember you just said um, with the with the server. Whenever there is an error, it, it gives you the chance to edit the code right from the browser. Browser. Yeah. So that that one, I get it. So this this mistake is a genuine mistake, and so it is throwing an error. But read the read this the. This appears error. to be a. a, a you say it appears to be what? Anyone with an idea? Okay, so look, look at look at all the all the handlers so far and see what is different about this third one, the redirect one. What what is wrong with it? Like the redirect one, it will lead you to the main uh, web website. 
Yes, and that's what I want to do, but why is it not working? Well, it, it looks like that one has to yeah, 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 yeah. function. Yes. Uh, Charity was saying something. Charity, what did you say again? It has no return function. It's exactly. not returning. Exactly. So you, I forgot to add the return here. And in every um, view handler, you need to return the response. If you don't return it, the server doesn't know what to send to the client. So when I left out return, it didn't know what to send to the client. That is why it, it, it gave me the error. But you see that now when I fixed it, it has redirected me to Google. Okay? And a redirect means it will actually leave your website and go to the site that you have redirected to. So I came to our website, this is our homepage, but then I added a URL called fake Google. And when you go to fake Google, it goes to the original Google website and you can see that the URL in the browser actually changed. So this is one way to redirect. So you um, redirect, you just, you import redirect from Flask. So you say from Flask import redirect and then you say redirect and then you provide the URL that you wanted to redirect to. Is it making sense? Okay, so I will assume that it is making sense. Okay, what what other use case of redirect can you guys think of? So, um, um, what's what's her name again? Forgotten her name. Charity. Charity spoke of um, using redirect for authentication. What other use of redirect can you get? And even in terms of um, authentication, one more thing you can do is, you know, when your site is behind authentication, there is no guarantee that people will always start from the login page. Somebody might want to access his profile page. So you use this redirect, you check. That is a point where you check if the person has not logged in, then you redirect the person back to the home page. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so I'm going to show you one more thing. Now, for all the route handlers that we have defined, you can see that we did um, app.route, we, we placed the app.route, the creator, and then we created a, a function. But one other thing we can do is by this. We can just define any function we want. So we say, def, let's say go to Facebook. Okay, and over here, you will return, I'm going to redirect to Facebook. So https colon slash slash facebook.com. Okay, now we have, we have defined this go to Facebook page, but our server doesn't know about it because we have not registered the route handler. So one way of registering the route handler is Either you use the decorator like the app.route and then you specify the, the URL and then the function. So what, what happens is when a request comes to your web server, your web server is going to check the URL that the request hit and then it will invoke the function that has been registered as a handler for that URL. Okay. But if you define your function this way, like a normal Python function and you then add the at app.route decorator to it, one way you can make it available is to say app.addURL rule, okay? Now, the add URL rule takes um, three parameters. The first one is the URL that you want people to specify. So I'm going to call this fake Facebook. And then the second is a name that you want to give to your endpoint. By the way, Whenever you register a, um, a route handler with the at app.route, the creator, it creates a name for an endpoint. And so the endpoint name becomes, by default, the name of the function. So the endpoint name for show profile is show profile. For go to Google is go to Google. Now, because we are not using the at app, the, the creator on top of go to Facebook, if we want to register it using the add, url rule then we need to give it a name so i'm going to call it facebook you can also call it go to facebook and for now you don't know what you can use this for but when we start working with links you understand 
how to use it. Then the last one is you specify the function that you want to use, um, you want to be called when that URL is hit. So let's check if um, it has reloaded and then I will go to uh, our web server, http colon slash slash localhost 5000 slash fake, I think Facebook, I guess. Yeah, so you can see that I, I, I created a go to Facebook route handler and I'm using the redirect to redirect it to Facebook. But I did it without specifying the at, um, at app.route the creator on top of it. And so the manual way to register this function as the request handler is to call app.addURL group. You specify the URL. This is what you need to enter into your browser to get it invoked. This is a name you are giving to the endpoint, which is useful when you begin to work with links. And then the go to Facebook is the name of the function that you want to call when this URL is hit. So when anybody um, goes to your website and point you to slash face, fake, um, fake Facebook, what happens is your server is going to call go to Facebook. And go to Facebook is going to return a redirect to Facebook.com. So any questions so far? I, I, I want questions so that we can continue because maybe some of you are um, confused and you are silent with it. So just feel free and ask any question if you understand what's going on. Sayedu Mohammed, are you with us? I'm with you. Gideon Knox, are you with us? Yeah. Henry Kwashiki. Now I'm calling register. <laughs> so you understand up to this point? Yeah. Okay, great. So um one more thing I want to show you. So that I, I I want to avoid overloading you with information. And today is just the first start. So I just wanted you to be able to know how to um, intercept the HTTP request and then provide a response to it. So we are returning um, um, your suite profile. We are returning red direct and blah, blah, blah. But Flask also makes it possible for us to create dynamic URLs, okay? Let's say we want to create a page that says hello. But we don't want it to say just hello prof. We want it to say hello to any name that you specify. So let's go ahead and then create that. I'm going to put that on top. And by the way, when the web server is resolving view functions, and what I mean by resolving view functions is whenever I request hit hey, the server, it's going to look at the URL that hits the server. And then it will map the URL to the function. Okay, it will map it to a view function. So all these view functions that you have defined here, all these view functions that you have defined are mapped to the corresponding URLs that have been registered on top of them. So we are able to create something that is dynamic where you can provide a parameter into the URL and then you use it in the response. But what I wanted to draw your attention to is that when it comes to resolving the URL, it is done in the order in which you define it. So take that into consideration. If um, a request comes to um, fake Google, for instance, the server is just first going to check index, it's going to check profile, it's going to check um, fake Google. So you want to um, position your route handlers in a way that makes sense. I mean, as long as the route handler has been defined, the server will find it eventually. But um, sometimes if you have URLs that are similar, especially if you are using regular expressions to do some matching, then the other becomes important. So I'm going to create hello. So I'll say app.route and over here I'll say hello. Okay. Now see something that is different from this URL. I bring this and then I say name. Okay. Then I come here, I say def say hello name. And then I'll return hello um, plus name. Okay, that. But what the, the 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 important thing here is that it takes this extra um, path that comes after the URL 
and then it substitute it for the dynamic variable name that I, I included in the URL. So what makes it dynamic is these angle brackets that you put around it. Is it making sense? Who is confused? Can you go right again? So um, what happens if you call the URL um, without giving it a name? Okay, thanks. This is Python. Let's try it. So we come here, we go. Do you see it? Yeah. Yeah, because it, even though you, it, it is a dynamic path, that but it becomes required. There are ways for saying that it is not required. And over here, I think anything you know in Python um, should even apply. There are ways for even specifying default parameters so that when you don't apply it or not, and this is how I like to learn. I am teaching you this thing, but when you finish, play with it. Okay, so you know this is a, a function. It's a normal Python function. You want to see if somebody doesn't supply any name and you put a default parameter there, will it work? You try it. If it fails, you know it fails. You can take the end. You know it fails. This is the best way to learn. It's not just uh, what I've taught you, but play with it the good thing is you can't destroy anything on your computer by trying stuff and the beautiful thing is this is um, definitely python so you feel free to change things um, the way you want but uh, you, you just need to learn how to read the error messages and understand what it is trying to mean so if i come here and i say dora i don't know if i spot it but it is going to replace it there so i'm going to go over it again so that you understand it now when you look at all the route handlers we defined before we got to this point. You can see that for all of them, we just specified the URL that we want people to hit. So this is fake Google, and uh, we registered this one as face, um, fake Facebook. I don't know why I always want to swap it, face Facebook. Fake Facebook. And um, we also have profile. Inside all of these um, route handlers, you can see that we didn't have anything that is dynamic. So if you call slash profile 10 million times, it will show you your sweet profile 10 million times in the browser. But what if you want it to be dynamic? Let me show you something. Let's go to Facebook and see. If I go to facebook.com and I click on my profile, you can see that the URL changes to facebook.com slash pi Edward over here. So Facebook is doing a similar thing. They have that dynamic URL aspect of it. And so whenever you hit that route, they will replace that dynamic variable with the value you provided in here. So what this means is somewhere in Facebook's database, my ID is Pi Edward. And so they use this ID to fetch every information about me they need to show on my page. And then they render it on my page. I am sure if I look for Eric, or um, this is my friend Thomas Okai. I click on him. Let, let me go to um, his home page or something. Why is it so hard to go to somebody's home page? But you can see that it has gone to facebook.com slash thomas.okai. So basically, they are also, look, look at how nasty the URL has become now. Because they are using all these informations to fetch certain things from the database. So it becomes important if you want to add some dynamism to your web application you want to take some information so in in our example we are only showing it in the browser go back go back um http localhost localhost and 5000 so in our example i say hello we are just showing it in the browser. But what it means is this Dora will come to our application. So you see that in the handler, we also had a parameter. At this point, the parameter name matters. Okay? So if you place the, the dynamic aspect, you call it, let's say, full name, then you have to put over here full name as well. You can't put full name here and then just say name here. So what you are basically telling Flask is that when people hit the hello URL, they won't just hit the hello URL, but after hello, they will specify something else. That thing they specify, I want you to put it in this parameter called name. And inside here, we are just using it to 
um, as a normal Python uh, um, um, expression. Okay. I mean, we can even do to upper if in case you want to show the person's name in um, uppercase. So what I want you to take home is it is purely Python. It's not magical. What is happening here is now instead of writing your normal Python code, there is a server sitting between a client making a request, the server receiving the request, passing it, and handing over the data to your application so that your application can use it for whatever it wants to do. When we start talking to databases, we'll be doing a lot of these dynamic um, URL things. Because for example, if the database has to, uh, if, if your URL or the user has to specify some ID so that you use the ID to fetch information about the person, it will come through the URL. And so this is how you capture information from the URL and you make use of it in the logic, the core logic of your application. Once you have access to it, now you just give it a name, you put it in angle bracket, you give it a name, and then you use the same name in the definition of the function handler or the view handler or the view function. They are all the same things. Once it comes in here, it is a regular Python value and anything you can do in Python, you can do with it. So for example, I'm converting it to upper cases. So if I come here and I say Dora, you see that now Dora is shown in all caps. Even if I specified it as small, small caps, you can see that it is still showing as um, all caps. Any questions? We have um, 20 minutes. I would want to take questions and then do a recap of everything so that at least once you are leaving, you know how to practice what you have learned and um, clarify all your, your, your challenges. And you can read more about it so that tomorrow things will move a lot faster. But I'm very happy with the progress so far because you people are understanding it. And I am the type of teacher who focuses on you understanding so that when you go, you can begin to play with things the way you want instead of just knowing what you have been taught. So hello hello Pi. Yeah. Can you please scroll down to where the go to Facebook function is? Okay. Oh okay. Okay. Um I wanted to point out that um at the app dot add rule you are um I add add URL rule the if um we omit the first slash it throws an error because Okay. Okay. Um, I, I, I remember I encountered a similar error, so I wanted to really be sure whether you left it or you included it. So. Yeah, so um, when it comes to specifying the URL, you always have to begin it with a slash because um, everything before the slash is your IP address, is your service IP address. So the slash is what actually specifies that unique aspect of it that determines what view, function, uh, view handler has to be called. So that it's important that you always begin it with a slash. Yeah, and that, that's a very good uh, um, observation and you see you got this because you tried it and then it failed and that's the beauty that is the learning what we are doing now is not learning it is lecturing the learning happens when you sit down you mess things up and then you fix it yourself that is when you are learning so it's good okay and um, one more thing it seems that all the routes handlers why don't we keep them in a separate folder and then call it as a, a, a Python module? Yeah, de definitely. Like like I said, you are free to do everything. But because these are basics, I don't want to confuse people. I don't know um, people's um, um, depth of experience with Python. So I'm not um, um, I'm bent on writing clean code here. But definitely, I have projects that I've worked on using Python and um, using Flask. And I have oh, over 500 files because because you want to break things down into like logical units. So for example, if you are building a complete application, you want to keep all your routes for user management into maybe a users.py. If it's an e-commerce, you want to keep anything related to product in a product.py. And you are free to import functions up and down and then use them wherever you want. Okay, okay. Um, one more thing. Um, when you talk about microservices, which which module will you recommend for microservices with respect to Python and Flask? Which module? What do you mean by module? Because to run something like a, a back end like this, you would need microservices to be communicating with each other. For instance, if it's an IoT um, application, and probably you need one service to be communicating with the hardware, another service to be 
passing or probably manipulating the, 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 the values or the data and everything like that. Another maybe service to be communicating with the client, how they are going to communicate with, with each other over a network. Okay. Which 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 mode or which method of implementation we use or which probably there's an external Python module um, you are aware of that would make everything easier. Okay. Because I know for, for Node.js there's one called Seneca JS and um, it's quite it's quite um, <laughs> it's quite sharp so okay so um let, let, let me let me make something clear that's simple to you so um when it comes to communication between microservices there is no standard way even though the most common way of letting microservices communicate with each other is through json apis it used to be xml but xml is uh, difficult to pass if you have ever ha uh, written a program to pass xml before you know it's not the most um, fun thing you want to do and even looking at XML as a human being is difficult to pass. So what we pretty much do of late is to use uh, JSON APIs and they have been adds on. So they have uh, JSON RPC or we even have um, regular RPCs or you have um, protocol buffers, which is also something from Google. So like there is no standard way, but the most common way is for one microservice to communicate with the other through a JSON API and we'll learn how to build it. I'm sure by Wednesday we'll reach the point where we'll be creating APIs. So you will know how to make a call from one microservice to the other. But the point of microservice architecture is to be able to break down your project in such a way that different teams can take care of, independently take care of different aspects of the project without stepping on each other's toes. For example, if you are trying to build something like um, Facebook, Facebook is a very huge system. There is an advertisement section, there's a regular social um, um, networking aspect of it. There is even when it comes to uploading of pictures and processing of videos and, and the messenger and all those things. If one team works on it, very soon you see that the code base becomes so big that if you throw a new joiner into the into the team, they, they will not be able to navigate the, the code base. So what happens is, if you go to Facebook, for instance, they will have a separate team for Messenger, separate team for even photo uploads is an entire team. Video upload is an entire team. Your likes and comments could be an entire team. And each one of these people are free to use any technologies that they want. It happens a lot, like in the companies that I work at, that we have lots of microservices in the hundreds every single one of them handling different aspects and so when you need data you need to ask yourself okay which microservice is posting this data and you don't care which language they wrote it in that's the beauty of microservices so that if your team is such that somebody knows only c sharp another person knows only python another person knows only java they should still be able to work together it's not like because um you know java you need to go and learn python because before you can work with no the solution that microservices brings is divide your project in such a way that somebody can work on user management in Java, somebody can work on payments in Python, somebody can work on callbacks or chargebacks in C Sharp, and they can all communicate with each other using JSON or any other communication protocol. But JSON is the most common um, form of communication out there. And um, another advantage of microservices is that it helps you to to still have your business running even when one service is done because if you put everything in one convoluted code base when there is an error your entire business is done but if it is a microservice you can say oh i'm not able to sign up but people are still able to pay so your business is running that that is the advantage but it comes with its own troubles like when it comes to managing teams and then getting the around but it's great hello Ed. hello pa hello yeah. Um, you could actually send, um, um, for instance, a PowerPoint giving us a brief introduction to web design just to keep our minds, you know, it went straight into the coding and then I was, there are so many technical words being said, and I was, I was wondering what is it. I go to Google to search those things, and I think that if you get PowerPoint and then actually just give a brief of web design, the branches, something that it's actually it sets your mind. Okay, we are going to this, we are going to this, and this, this, this. At least it helps me to. I just that's what I want to say. 
Okay, so um, thank you very much, and I, I have definitely been in your position before, where you are in a class and you understand anything. Sure, yeah. And now, yeah. But that that's the fun aspect of it. So what it means is that this is you don't see. It. You see, wow. if you understand everything, life becomes too easy. I'm happy that you understand it. I'm very, very happy because now I can give you sleepless nights. You don't understand it, then you have to force and then you understand it, okay? So the jokes aside, like, what, what aspect of web development excites you? Because when you say web development is a large thing, what, what we are doing here is back-end development. Back-end development is, I mean, the unsung heroes in programming. Everybody goes to Facebook, they are clicking buttons and posting their shitty pictures and they are happy. All they care about is the front-end guys who use javascript and css to do that beautiful thing but behind the scenes are the real guys who do the wonderful things outside javascript and css so if you are getting into development you can choose how to do front-end which i suck at i don't know how to do front-end at all and it's okay it's okay see css is the most difficult thing i ever tried learning i do machine learning and i find machine learning way easier than css wow. <laughs> yes and yeah that, that's my problem because when it comes to design and stuff like that i don't try okay so you need to find a niche that excites you if what excites you more is being okay. in the front end doing the ui people are clicking and something is jumping over and all those kind of stuff then you have to focus on front end and for that you need to learn css javascript html after learning these three okay. the rest i will say may god be with you the reason i'm saying may god be with you is when it comes to even javascript alone the question is are you using react are you using preact are you using angular is it angular one is it angular two is it vjs just yesterday i saw that they have something called svelte or something something is it is it node.js is it um express js is it is it um, um um uh mean is it the mean stack i mean i find it frustrating because that is not my area but i'm happy at this point forget about the python we are learning feel free to ask any general question it could be um how you want to progress in your career what you want to do um, 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 if you want to switch career what you want to do even if you want um, international experience you want to leave ghana go work elsewhere and, like just ask any general question i'm saying this so that anybody can ask any question you can forget about what we are doing now i mean that's no. ended, but we need to that's the full advantage so you choose the niche that you like and then you hone in your skills there yeah, but it also okay. helps at least know a bit of what goes on in the back end so that you can work with back end. Okay. I don't do front end because I've played with um, JavaScript, CSS, and all those things a bit. Even when I was a pure back end developer, I could work with front end people. And being in Ghana helped me a lot because in Ghana, you don't have a front end team, a back end team. They hire you as a developer and you are Superman. You do everything. In Ghana, when they hire you, there's no back end, no front end. They give you the project and you do it. So I got the opportunity to play with the CSS and JavaScript and pick that. That doesn't excite me. That is why I am more into the back end. So find a okay. okay. area of web development that excites you the most and then hone in your skills there. Okay. All right. But okay. um, for, for this particular thing, I think the problem here is not um, 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 is not this session. The problem could be that you you don't understand python which means um i think eric you have some videos on python right yeah Basically. yeah 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 so it will really help if you can spend tonight and um, until tomorrow's meeting to watch it and i don't want you to get discouraged so join anya you will keep something in your mind you un understand something and when these five days are over i'm still available eric is still available we have youtube channels uh -huh. and by the way please i want a subscription from each one of you bless your brother with subscription you, you, you subscribed already <laughs> all of you no myself uh, hello <laughs> yeah hello yeah hello. yeah uh, so uh pi actually has uh, his own channel where he teaches serious machine learning, uh, learning stuff so I'll, I'll post i'll post i'll share his channel on our page okay and uh, seeing that most of you are concerned about the app, web app development the front end uh, in two weeks time i'm going to schedule uh, web app web application design with Vue.js. okay so those those who want to do something with the front end i think uh, you can you can join that particular class i'll do it in the 
two weeks time okay Vue.js. then right from there you can know how to integrate it with what python is teaching now because they work hand in hand okay all right so and python. even if you tomorrow we start um seven html from these applications so yeah. today we just focus on back end back end stuff but from tomorrow going i'll show you how you create your html page and you actually serve it from python so once you know backend, then you know front end, and you become a full stack developer. And a full stack developer is somebody a company can hire, and hopefully let you work on any project, whether it's backend or front end. So it comes with a bigger salary, bigger responsibilities, bigger headaches. And you make the choice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Python. Uh, Pi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, in the. Let's in take it. In the in the, uh, how, do you, how, how do you how do you blend uh, machine learning with the web services that we are doing? So let's say you want to do some serious AI stuff with your web backend. Yeah, can you can you throw more light on that? <laughs> okay. So um, basically, the, the the deliverable in every machine learning project is something called a model. And a model is nothing more than uh, some huge metrics of numbers. Just think of some big array, like one million by one million array of numbers. Okay. After all the noise in machine learning, what we end up is with is an array of numbers that has learned how to map some input to an output. Once you have the model, if you want to serve it for the world to use it, in my company, for instance, we use our Python to do that. What happens? This is, there is a way to load the model that you have the model as a file okay and in flask or in any framework of choice you would load the model from the file and at that point anything you know in your framework applies so if um, i had a model right now i could load it and then i can just create a route so let's say i've created a program to um, detect cancer in x-ray pictures what happens is i'll build the model I'll get a model file, I'll create a Flask project, load the model, and create a route handler just as we have done today. But in that route handler, you will serve an HTML page, which you learn how to do tomorrow. On that HTML page, I can put a button that you click to upload the X-ray image. When you upload the X-ray image, it will come to the server, and then the server will run it to the model. The model will tell you whether it is cancerous or not cancerous and then you return a response it's the same this return um, strings that we are doing here is the same the only difference is that in between the request hitting and the response going to the server you load your model and you run inference on it i, I hope um, that makes sense sure 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 so any questions hello Pi. yeah yeah can you give us any external say pdf or any material that could be useful in learning all these things okay i um, i actually bought some book years back which i used to learn black so that is the, is the, the content the, the content outline of that book i am following it is um, a seven page a seven chapter book but because we are doing five days i'm treating a chapter a day so i'm going to send that book to eric as a pdf so that he'll make it available to you on the whatsapp group. Yeah. Okay, okay. So it will help if everything I taught you today is actually in that book. So you can reread re it today, and because you have the book, just practice everything. Yeah, so, that would be perfect. Yeah. yeah. Trust me. Try, 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 and get Linux on your on your computer, or at least if you don't want to buy another computer, get yourself a Raspberry Pi. It's very cheap, like thirty five dollars. Get one connected to a monitor. This this guy here runs uh, uh, the full Linux operating system. So. You get a Raspberry Pi, get your stuff and monitor and some keyboards. That's all. If that is, if you don't want to use your laptop to run Linux, just get yourself a Raspberry Pi. I have a friend who sells some in Ghana. He's called Nicholas Tali, so you can find him on Facebook and then reach out to him. He will deliver to you and then just just use uh, Linux. Yeah, Nicholas Tali actually is supposed to be here, but I don't know why whether he didn't join us. He signed oh, okay. up. Yeah. Okay. Hello, hello, bye. Yeah. So, um, you know, some, sometimes when you go to Stack Overflow, you see these jobs, then other stuff. Um, as you know, I'm interested in data science. Like, how do I go about it and your know, advice on maybe entering into that kind of career? Okay, so um, the first thing I would say is 
your your choice of career should always be passing back okay it shouldn't be based on um, because it's a hot cake because there's money in it otherwise you may discuss over that g that thing before yeah so it should be passion based the, the question is why do you want to get into data science is it because now machine learning is a new tool and everybody is um, into it and uh, when you are into ai they think you are smarter than anybody that lives you which is not true it is just basic um, um, um high school mathematics that we do over there so um it should be passion based and once you are certain that the passion is there and you really want to get into uh, this development or the data science aspect of things you hone in all your skills i for instance um i started off as a mobile app developer in ghana and that is what most people knew me for and i really didn't like that because i'm the type i just want to be known as a developer i don't want you to tag me as mobile as well, a back-end developer i write code if you give me a core port and it has processor in it i can code it that is what i want to do okay so you 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 prepare yourself for it by reading materials getting books and if you go to my youtube channel i actually have a video where i talk of the books that i used to transition into data science up until um, january this year i was a back-ender i was working in um, a company here in berlin as a back-ender but i spent about two years to prepare myself to transition into ai and what i did was I took courses on Coursera, I took um, courses on Udacity, I took courses on Udemy, like I, I can't I can't recollect all the things I have learned plus my huge books that are there. I have spent a lot of money acquiring them. So once it is passion based, the learning will not be a problem. The problem then becomes knowing which resources to learn from. And like I said, I have made a video that tells you every resource that I use that helped me in the order in which I use it. So if you go to my YouTube channel, and you, you um, check my Mastering Deep Learning playlist, you should find the video's title is Resources. I have Resources 1 and Resources 2. So check those ones out. you see exactly what you need to learn. But for you to um, excel in data science, you need to um, even ask yourself further questions. Which aspect of data science excites you? Because data science encompasses data engineers, machine learning engineers, machine learning researchers. They are all data scientists. So you need to ask yourself, which aspect of data science do you want to do? The regular data scientist work involves um, gleaning insight from data. So if you say you are a data scientist, a raw data scientist, what it means is that you be in a company, let's say, the company is an e-commerce company. At the end of the month, they'll give you a lot of data about things that people are buying, um, um, things that people are not buying, and you have to sit down and write some code using Python and SQL to find out why things are the way they are. So data scientists are more um, reactive. They react to what is happening in an organization, and they try to explain why things are the way they are. And machine learning engineers are proactive. They predict. We work on predicting the future. So yes, we are both um, in the data science world, but we are in um, different ends. And if you want to go into data engineering, a data engineer works on moving large volumes of data between systems. So they, they are not machine learning engineers. They don't do training of models. They don't do deep learning. And they are not data scientists. They install the tools like uh, Kafka and, 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 and uh, Apache Spark, all the tools that you need to move data. Yeah. Okay. And um, you you also asked a question about um, getting a job outside. So yes. the process is very simple. You go to Stack Overflow jobs, and then you filter the location based on the country or the city you want to work in. And um, the good news is there are a lot of shortage when it comes to these um, tech jobs. So people don't mind where you are coming from. They will still hire you as long as you pass their interviewing process okay so the way to pass the interviewing process it takes preparation because the way they test programmers is not the best we all know it's not the best like there are some algorithms they will give you at interviews that apart from the time dr Aqua taught you or you learned in school you have never revisited and it's <laughs> that you will ever ever use in your work like Somebody can ask you to implement red black trees, but in my entire 10 years of software engineering, I have never had the need to implement a red black tree from scratch. But unfortunately, this is how they test us, okay? So you get a book. There is a book called um, Cracking the Coding Interview. 
So they, they have a lot of questions from Amazon and, and uh, Google and Facebook. Practice them. It is very important that you practice to prepare because trust me, when you are doing coding in an interview, the anxiety is different from when you are doing coding at the comfort of your home in the night when there is no pressure on you. This one, you are coding to please somebody whose level of policing will decide whether you can get a job or not. So it needs serious preparation. So be set realistic goal, know where you stand, know your level of uh, programming and be realistic. Averagely, eight months should be enough for you to prepare to um, um, hit any programming job that you want. But if you are already uh, conversant with the programming language and then you have some experience in it, you can go ahead and apply. But the most important thing is go to Stack Overflow job, filter the jobs by location and by the job title that you want. And see, even when you know you don't qualify, apply for it. Trust me, it is the best way to build experience because you cannot just prepare in your room and one day decide to apply. The anxiety, the exposure to the anxiety is important. Like me, for instance, when I was on campus, I applied to Google Jobs and the basic requirement was PhD. That time I didn't even have my BS. Uh. Yes. So when I was applying, I knew that I'm not going to get it, but I applied for my own benefit. I applied and see, ask yourself, they said they want a PhD. I don't have a degree. I stated that I'm yet to get my degree and they still called me for an interview. What it means is that the PhDs are not applying for the job. So it is still there for the taking. So I went in there, they bombarded me with their questions. I didn't understand it. I failed nicely, but it helped me. So the next time I sat there, I asked that interview. Yeah, yeah you, can, you can fail nicely because it was nice because I knew I was going to fail. You get it? I knew I was going to fail. So I went in there boldly, failed boldly, but it was still a blessing to me because I learned how they conduct the interviews, the kind of questions, even the manner in which um, they want you to behave. So it's like you are thinking through with the person on the on, on, on the interview and then you are coding with it. So apply, 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 apply. There are some of them too, when you apply, they will send you the interview questions and you answer them in your browser with a timer. That even makes you more anxious. But the moment you submit it, they tell you whether you passed or not. And before I came here, I did interviews that I scored 10 over 100. It doesn't mean you are bad. It doesn't mean you are bad. You just fill that particular interview. You can't know all the all the questions, interview questions in this world. So just apply more, fill more, more and then you you pass through. Okay, thank you very much. All right, any more questions? Our time is up. We are six minutes, uh, should I say, into the future. Hey, let's take like two more questions and then round up. So that those uh, who Pi is actually two hours ahead of us, so that means it's very late at this end. It's, it's ten six. Yeah. Yeah. Charity. Hello, Pi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask how you can set up um a Linux environment with um with Raspberry Pi. So um the the Raspberry OS. Well, okay. I'm uh, my screen is still shared, right? So I'm going to show yeah. You, uh, uh, Raspbian OS. So just go to Google and Google Raspbian. So Raspbian is um, the official operating system that comes with the Raspberry Pi and it is based on Linux. So once once you install Raspbian, you have Linux on your computer. Otherwise, you can also install the full blown uh, Ubuntu on your computer. So this is the Raspbian website where you can download any one of them. You get um, an SD card like this, you place the SD card in here. You put it in your computer and you download um, a software called Etcher. Okay. So let me open Etcher. Yeah, so Etcher Balena. So you download the software. What the, the way it works is you select the image. So you download the operating system image on your computer. You insert your um, SD card and then you select the SD card on which you want to flash. And then you click on flash. It will copy it onto the SD card. You insert the SD card into the Raspberry Pi. When you power it, you have a full blown Linux. In the room. And this is actually very powerful. Like this Raspberry Pi 4, it comes with 4 gig of RAM, which is much bigger than the laptop I started with, so, and probably much bigger than the RAM of some of you on laptop as well. Okay, okay. And then, do you have any um, 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 resource materials that I can use to um, be frequent with uh, Raspberry Pi and then the Linux environment? 
I think I've, so for some of these things, there are too many videos on YouTube about them that I don't even see the need to add more. You just go to Google, there, there are too much videos on it. Go to YouTube, find a very good one. Otherwise, um, this evening I'll find some and then tomorrow I'll share the link with you. I'll okay. This is a video, then I'll share the link with you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but um, for, for, for one general advice I want to give all of you is the best way to learn is to teach. Okay? So as, as you are learning, find somebody to teach. You see that what you are able to teach, you never forget. You can never forget what you are able to teach. So you, to help you learn, catch your junior brother and say, I'm teaching you programming. If you don't have a junior brother, catch your mother, catch your father, say, Papa, this is corona thing. We don't know whether we will die or not. If you die, it's better you die with some programming language. So learn programming. <laughs> people, are, people are spreading conspiracy theories. Exactly. Them that people who know programming will not die from corona. <laughs> it's true. We, we, we yeah, will not go that, that, that. If you know programming, you will not die from mm-hmm. corona. That's yeah. it. Okay. All your programming will come. You are paying from the village. <laughs> all right all right all right all right any any last questions the ladies please ask, yeah. ask the last question yeah please a question yeah i used to do all both windows and the liners but then now when i try loading the liners it does not run at all grab you, you may up your grab <laughs> are you are you close to eric in any way like in which city are you I'm a bombso now, Kumasi. Uh, Eric, where are yes. you? Yes. I'm at Nebula, where stars are born. I hear the answer. That's the arena. I hear the arena. So, so um, I, I will say see Eric because it's quite technical to uh, fix grab. I mean, I, I see that you're a hardcore lady. So oh, it's just, it's just one of my students. She's a hard. Hey. Yeah, I mean, I can so, since charity begins at home, start by trying to fix it. Go to YouTube, find some videos. I mean, the beautiful thing about these computers is you can't destroy them. You can't destroy them. Hey. <laughs> so just just try. If it doesn't work, you go to Eric and then he fixes it for you. But it, it is just you have messed up. Maybe when you installed Linux, you finished and you installed Windows. The Windows Windows load that took over Grab. But Grab is a greedy um, um, bastard. He wants to take over the world. So he wants to be the Windows loader. So when you put another one, then it's not going to go to the Windows. There, there, there is actually a tool for fixing it. You you run, you download it and you run that. So I've forgotten the name, but there is a tool like that for fixing your grab. I see. I I, I personally never like um, dual boot. I don't like the whole idea of shutting mm. down just to get to another OS. So charity, try and get yourself a, a, a Raspberry Pi. It, 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 you you really love it, trust me. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. I think this has been interesting so far. Uh, everything that begins initially, you have you have fractions one uh, somewhere, but I think so far so good. Okay, so um, Pi would uh, upload the code that he wrote on our Tech Foundation uh, GitHub page. So I'll share that link. You go there, you download it. Then, like he said, just make copies, change stuff. The learning is when you do it. Okay. What we will be doing here with you is the teaching, but it will take time for you to master through the learning. And I'm also going to fix this uh, recording. I'm going to fix this session and quickly upload it. So I'm I'm going to try and make it available by tomorrow morning, so that those who couldn't follow well, you can. Uh, play it over and over and practice along then uh, when i'm done and i'm not feeling sleepy one thing i'll do is record the intro video of how to set it up on the windows for you and upload that one too all right so any questions okay. yeah, pro, pro, don't forget to get us the pdf okay from five sure 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 sure, sure. sure. It's very necessary, yeah. okay and uh yeah let me google it and just share the link so yeah. that you can download it okay, okay. yeah um hello hello yeah so uh like i said i would uh, because of the need for the web application the front end side in two weeks time 
uh, we will schedule a, a program on how to design web applications using Vue.js. Actually, that is what I use for all my work. Any website that I design, it's always a single page app, a PWA, a progressive web app. Then I link it to a Django backend or a Laravel backend. Okay, so uh, we will do we will do a, a program, a training on how to build web applications using Vue.js. So um, in two weeks' time, if you are interested, you can sign up for that one. Too, okay, all right. Yeah, um, please, um, Pai, can you yeah. please um, um, share your the link of um, the book in the comments and yeah, the chat so that you can that. Just... Okay, there's a chat here. So I've shared the link there. Just click on it and download it and start. All right, thank you. Yeah, so um, it's called Last Word Development, written by uh, Miguel Grinder. It's a very good book. That's what I used to do. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Bye. So thank you very much. Uh, we hope for more tomorrow. And uh, uh, I think so far we had a consistent. We 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 started with about seventeen, and uh, we are ending with fourth. And I don't know whether it's internet issues or. But others were now trying to call me to set up, but it was too late. So please uh, let us all try and join in tomorrow, okay? Uh, those who haven't made their registration payment, please. You see what we are, what is happening here? The data, the platform for the tutorials. You have to be paying for all these things. So just support us with your registration fee, and uh, let's do more for our nation and for our continent, okay? The next time there is a pandemic, Africa should be the one leading the help, not the one accepting the aid. Yeah, that, that's why they create the new vaccines and come and inject it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And normally the background, a new vehicle better stay ahead. Hmm? Ghana Standard Board. I don't know what they are doing and all those things. So please, that is the aim of Tech Foundation to give the, the youth the power to do some of these things. So help us. We are self-founding everything right now. Though we have a couple of sponsorship, you can help us donate to support us and all those things. So the registration fee that we took is not to charge you. Obviously, a training like this will cost more than that. It's just to assist us with the work that we are doing. You just to learn Python. Yeah. Fifteen thousand just to learn Python. Just Python, not web development. Just Python. Yeah, so please, uh, hence for all the programs that we'll be hosting on Zoom, you we'll try to take something small, okay, just to support it. So just bear with that. The training, it's our wish to make it free. Okay, so thank you all for coming. Uh, don't forget, spend the night. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, is you are still on lockdown, so enjoy the night programming. I'll be online. If you need any help, you can DM me or you can still post on the uh, uh, the python page it's meant it's meant for discussions questions and all those things so so far as the question whatever you want to ask us python i am there pi is also there just ask it okay but let us try and keep the noise and everything under control so that people will not feel uh, disturbed okay all right so thank you very much for coming see you same time tomorrow this is tech foundation making africa tech literate bye bye Bye. This brings us to the end of our tutorials on uh, floating point data types. Now, in the next tutorial, I'm going to talk about functions, okay? Now, as I always say, please don't fall prey to shortcuts. Learning programming requires you to spend time to obey the process, spend time to understand the basics, don't be in a rush. If you go in rashly, you will end up not knowing anything. Is that okay? Remember, follow the process. Take your time to understand the language that you are using. You are as good as how best you can use your tools. Now, I want to express my gratitude to our partners and sponsors. Saytech designs and builds smart agricultural machinery suited for African conditions and use. They also provide fabrication training and computer-aided design services to manufacturing industries. 
Seriatech Technologies is an electronic component retail shop at China House Adum Kumase. So you can contact them for all your electronic components, including Arduino kit and sensors of all kinds. Teskin Enterprise is the number one distributor of electronic components, electrical components, and hardware. You can locate them at HM4 Market Kumase. Call them for all your electronics and hardware needs from analog to digital devices. Electronics deal in smart electronic system development, software and web apps, IoT system design, project and research, and IT training. You can contact us for your next multi million dollar project. If you want to be a sponsor or partner of this program, please call us on the numbers displayed on your screen and we will be happy to sit down with you. You can also donate in cash or in kind to support our training. We actually need a good camera and sound system for our video recordings and uh, I'm planning on starting an electronic session and I will need these tools for better uh, video recordings, okay? Your support will be very appreciated. You can Momo us any amount using the Momo account on the screen, okay? From 5 cities to 500 billion Ghana cities or dollars everything would be welcome now remember kitwe bien so help us make africa tech literate once again thanks for watching this tutorial don't forget to like the video and subscribe to this channel we want to know how we can make this training better for you so let us hear from you by posting a comment in the comment box below all right i am professor and this is tech foundation